This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Moira Fogarty, Toronto, Ontario. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 36. The Apple of Discord. Beside Fafine Beck's mother, another power had word to say to Monsieur Paul and me, before that covenant of friendship could be ratified. We were under the surveillance of a sleepless eye. Rome watched jealously her son through that mystic lattice at which I had knelt once, and to which Monsieur Emmanuel drew nigh month by month, the sliding panel of the confessional. "'Why were you so glad to be friends with Monsieur Paul?' asks the reader. "'Had he not long been a friend to you? Had he not given proof on proof of a certain partiality in his feelings?' "'Yes, he had.' But still I like to hear him say so earnestly that he was my close, true friend. I liked his modest doubts, his tender deference, that trust which longed to rest and was grateful when taught how. He had called me sister. It was well. Yes, he might call me what he pleased, so long as he confided in me. I was willing to be his sister, on condition that he did not invite me to fill that relation to some future wife of his— and tacitly vowed as he was to celibacy, of this dilemma there seemed little danger. Through most of the succeeding night I pondered that evening's interview. I wanted much the morning to break, and then listened for the bell to ring, and, after rising and dressing, I deemed prayers and breakfast slow, and all the hours lingering, till that arrived at last which brought the lesson of literature. My wish was to get a more thorough comprehension of this fraternal alliance, to note with how much of the brother he would demean himself when we met again, to prove how much of the sister was in my own feelings, to discover whether I could summon a sister's courage, and he a brother's frankness. He came. Life is so constructed that the event does not, cannot, will not match the expectation. That whole day he never accosted me. His lesson was given rather more quietly than usual, more mildly and also more gravely. He was fatherly to his pupils, but he was not brotherly to me. Ere he left the class, I expected a smile if not a word. I got neither. To my portion fell one nod, hurried, shy. This distance, I argued, is accidental. It is involuntary, patience, and it will vanish. It vanished not. It continued for days. It increased. I suppressed my surprise and swallowed whatever feelings began to surge. Well, might I ask, when he offered fraternity, dare I rely on you? Well, might he, doubtless knowing himself, withhold all pledge? True, he had bid me make my own experiments, tease and try him. Vain injunction! Privilege nominal and unavailable. Some women might use it. Nothing in my powers or instinct placed me among this brave band. Left alone, I was passive. Repulsed, I withdrew. Forgotten. My lips would not utter, nor my eyes dart a reminder. It seemed there had been an error somewhere in my calculations, and I waited for a time to disclose it. But the day came when, as usual, he was to give me a lesson. One evening in seven he had long generously bestowed on me, devoting it to the examination of what had been done in various studies during the past week, and to the preparation of work for the week in prospect. On these occasions, my schoolroom was anywhere, wherever the pupils and the other teachers happened to be, or in their close vicinage, very often in the large second division where it was easy to choose a quiet nook when the crowding day pupils were absent, and the few boarders gathered in a knot about the surveillance astrade. On the customary evening, hearing the customary hour strike, I collected my books and papers, my pen and ink, and sought the large division. In class there was no one and it lay all in cool, deep shadow, but through the open double doors was seen the carré, filled with pupils and with light. Over hall and figures blushed the westering sun. It blushed so ruddily and vividly that the hues of the walls and the variegated tints of the dresses seemed all fused in one warm glow. The girls were seated, working or studying. In the midst of their circle stood Monsieur Emmanuel, speaking good-humouredly to a teacher. His dark patteau, his jetty hair, were tinged with many a reflex of crimson. His Spanish face, when he turned it momentarily, 
answered the son's animated kiss with an animated smile. I took my place at desk. The orange trees and several plants, full and bright with bloom, basked also in the sun's laughing bounty. They had partaken it the whole day, and now asked water. Monsieur Emmanuel had a taste for gardening. He liked to tend and foster plants. I used to think that working amongst shrubs with a spade or a watering pot soothed his nerves. It was a recreation to which he often had recourse, and now he looked to the orange trees, the geraniums, the gorgeous cactuses, and revived them all with the refreshment their draught needed. His lips, meantime, sustained his precious cigar, that, for him, first necessary and prime luxury of life. Its blue wreaths curled prettily enough amongst the flowers, and in the evening light. He spoke no more to the pupils, nor to the mistresses, but gave many an endearing word to a small spanieles, if one may coin a word, that nominally belonged to the house, but virtually owned him as master, being fonder of him than of any inmate. A delicate, silky, loving, and lovable little doggy she was, trotting at his side, looking with expressive, attached eyes into his face, and whenever he dropped his bonnet grec or his handkerchief, which he did occasionally in play, crouching beside it with the air of a miniature lion guarding a kingdom's flag. There were many plants, and as the amateur gardener fetched all the water from the well in the court, with his own active hands, his work spun out to some length. The great school clock ticked on. Another hour struck. The carré and the youthful group lost the illusion of sunset. Day was drooping. My lesson, I perceived, must tonight be very short. But the orange trees, the cacti, the camellias were all served now. Was it my turn? Alas! In the garden were more plants to be looked after. Favorite rose bushes, certain choice flowers, little Sylvie's glad bark and whine followed the receding paletot down the alleys. I put up some of my books. I should not want them all. I sat and thought and waited, involuntarily deprecating the creeping invasion of twilight. Sylvie, gaily frisking, emerged into view once more, heralding the returning paletot. The watering pot was deposited beside the well. It had fulfilled its office. How glad I was! Monsieur washed his hands in a little stone bowl. There was no longer time for a lesson now. Ere long the prayer bell must ring. But still we should meet. He would speak. A chance would be offered of reading in his eyes the riddle of his shyness. His ablutions over, he stood, slowly rearranging his cuffs, looking at the horn of a young moon, set pale in the opal sky, and glimmering faint on the aureole of Jean-Baptiste. Sylvie watched the mood contemplative, its stillness irked her. She whined and jumped to break it. He looked down. Petite exigeante, said he. You must not be forgotten one moment, it seems. He stooped, lifted her in his arms, sauntered across the court within a yard of the line of windows near one of which I sat. He sauntered lingeringly, fondling the spaniel in his bosom, calling her tender names in a tender voice. On the front doorsteps he turned. Once again he looked at the moon, at the Giray Cathedral, over the remoter spires and house roofs, fading into a blue sea of night mist. He tasted the sweet breath of dusk, and noted the folded bloom of the garden. He suddenly looked round. A keen beam out of his eye raised the white façade of the classes, swept the long line of Quasi. I think he bowed. If he did, I had no time to return the courtesy. In a moment he was gone. The moonlit threshold lay pale and shadowless before the closed front door. Gathering in my arms all that was spread on the desk before me, I carried back the unused heap to its place in the third class. The prayer bell rang. I obeyed its summons. The morrow would not restore him to the Rue Fossette, that day being devoted to his college. I got through my teaching. I got over the intermediate hours. I saw evening approaching and armed myself for its heavy ennui. Whether it was worse to stay with my co-inmates or to sit alone, I had not considered. I naturally took up the latter alternatives. If there was a hope of comfort for any moment, the heart or head of no human being in this house could yield it. Only under the lid of my desk could it harbor, nestling between the leaves of some book, gilding a pencil point, the nib of a pen, or tinging the black fluid in that ink glass. 
With a heavy heart, I opened my desk lid. With a weary hand, I turned up its contents. One by one, well-accustomed books, volumes, sewn in familiar covers, were taken out and put back hopeless. They had no charm. They could not comfort. Is this something new, this pamphlet in lilac? I have not seen it before, and I rearranged my desk this very day, this very afternoon. The tract must have been introduced within the last hour while we were at dinner. I opened it. What was it? What would it say to me? It was neither tale nor poem, neither essay nor history. It neither sung nor related nor discussed. It was a theological work. It preached and it persuaded. I lent to it my ear very willingly, for, small as it was, it possessed its own spell and bound my attention at once. It preached Romanism. It persuaded to conversion. The voice of that sly little book was a honeyed voice. Its accents were all unction and balm. Here roared no utterance of Rome's thunders, no blasting of the breath of her displeasure. The Protestant was to turn papist, not so much in fear of the heretic's hell, as on account of the comfort, the indulgence, the tenderness Holy Church offered. Far be it from her to threaten or to coerce. Her wish was to guide and win. She persecute? Oh, dear, no! Not on any account! This meek volume was not addressed to the hardened and worldly. It was not even strong meat for the strong. It was milk for babes, the mild effluence of a mother's love towards her tenderest and her youngest, intended wholly and solely for those whose head is to be reached through the heart. Its appeal was not to intellect. It sought to win the affectionate through their affections, the sympathizing through their sympathies. St. Vincent de Paul, gathering his orphans about him, never spoke more sweetly. I remember one capital inducement to apostasy was held out in the fact that a Catholic who had lost dear friends by death could enjoy the unspeakable solace of praying them out of purgatory. The writer did not touch on the firmer peace of those whose belief dispenses with purgatory altogether. But I thought of this, and on the whole preferred the latter doctrine as the most consolatory. The little book amused, and did not painfully displease me. It was a canting, sentimental, shallow little book, yet something about it cheered my gloom and made me smile. I was amused with the gambols of this unlicked wolf-cub, muffled in the fleece, and mimicking the bleat of a guileless lamb. Portions of it reminded me of certain Wesleyan Methodist tracts I had once read when a child. They were flavored with about the same seasoning of excitation to fanaticism. He that had written it was no bad man, and while perpetually betraying the trained cunning, the cloven hoof of his system, I should pause before accusing himself of insincerity. His judgment, however, wanted surgical props. It was rickety. I smiled then over this dose of maternal tenderness, coming from the ruddy old lady of the Seven Hills, smiled too at my own disinclination, not to say disability, to meet these melting favours. Glancing at the title page, I found the name of Père Silas. A fly-leaf bore in small but clear and well-known pencil characters from P C D E to L Y, and when I saw this I laughed, but not in my former spirit. I was revived. A mortal bewilderment cleared suddenly from my head and vision. The solution of the Sphinx riddle was one. The conjunction of those two names, Père Silas and Paul Emmanuel, gave the key to all. The penitent had been with his director, permitted to withhold nothing, suffered to keep no corner of his heart sacred to God and to himself, the whole narrative of our late interview had been drawn from him. He had avowed the covenant of fraternity, and spoken of his adopted sister. How could such covenant, such adoption, be sanctioned by the Church? Fraternal communion with a heretic? I seemed to hear Père Silas annulling the unholy pact, warning his penitent of its perils, entreating, enjoining reserve, nay, by the authority of his office, and in the name and by the memory of all Monsieur Emmanuel held most dear and sacred, commanding the enforcement of that new system whose frost had pierced to the marrow of my bones. These may not seem pleasant hypotheses, yet by comparison they were welcome. The vision of a ghostly troubler hovering in the background was as nothing matched with the fear of spontaneous change arising in Monsieur Paul himself. At this distance of time, I cannot be sure how far the above conjectures were self-suggested, 
or in what measure they owed their origin and confirmation to another quarter. Help was not wanting. This evening there was no bright sunset. West and east were one cloud. No summer night mist, blue yet rose-tinged, softened the distance. A clammy fog from the marshes crept grey round Villette. Tonight the watering pot might rest in its niche by the well. A small rain had been drizzling all the afternoon, and still it fell fast and quietly. This was no weather for rambling in the wet alleys under the dripping trees, and I started to hear Sylvie's sudden bark in the garden, her bark of welcome. Surely she was not accompanied, and yet this glad, quick bark was never uttered save in homage to one presence. Through the glass door and the arching berceau I commanded the deep vista of the Allée Défendue. Thither rushed Sylvie, glistening through its gloom like a white gelder rose. She ran to and fro, whining, springing, harassing little birds amongst the bushes. I watched five minutes. No fulfillment followed the omen. I returned to my books. Sylvie's sharp bark suddenly ceased. Again I looked up. She was standing not many yards distant, wagging her white feathery tail as fast as the muscle would work, and intently watching the operations of a spade, plied fast by an indefatigable hand. There was Monsieur Emmanuel, bent over the soil, digging in the wet mould amongst the rain-laden and streaming shrubs, working as hard as if his day's pittance were yet to earn by the literal sweat of his brow. In this sign I read a ruffled mood. He would dig thus in frozen snow on the coldest winter day when urged inwardly by painful emotion, whether of nervous excitation or sad thoughts or self-reproach. He would dig by the hour with knit brow and set teeth, nor once lift his head or open his lips. Sylvie watched till she was tired, again scampering devious, bounding here, rushing there, snuffing and sniffing everywhere. She at last discovered me in class. Instantly she flew barking at the panes, as if to urge me forth to share her pleasure, or her master's toil. She had seen me occasionally walking in that alley with Monsieur Paul, and I doubt not considered it my duty to join him now, wet as it was. She made such a bustle that Monsieur Paul at last looked up, and of course perceived why, and at whom she barked. He whistled to call her off. She only barked the louder. She seemed quite bent upon having the glass door opened. Tired, I suppose, with her importunity, he threw down his spade, approached, and pushed the door ajar. Sylvie burst in, all impetuous, sprang to my lap, and with her paws at my neck and her little nose and tongue somewhat overpoweringly busy about my face, mouth, and eyes, flourished her bushy tail over the desk, and scattered books and papers far and wide. Monsieur Emmanuel advanced to still the clamour, and repair the disarrangement. Having gathered up the books, he captured Sylvie and stowed her away under his pale toe, where she nestled as quiet as a mouse, her head just peeping forth. She was very tiny, and had the prettiest little innocent face, the silkiest long ears, the finest dark eyes in the world. I never saw her but I thought of Paulina de Bassompierre. Forgive the association, reader, it would occur. Monsieur Paul petted and patted her. The endearments she received were not to be wondered at. She invited affection by her beauty and her vivacious life. While caressing the spaniel, his eye roved over the papers and books just replaced. It settled on the religious tract. His lips moved. He half-checked the impulse to speak. What? Had he promised never to address me more? If so, his better nature pronounced the vow, more honoured in the breach than in the observance. For with a second effort he spoke. "'You have not yet read the brochure, I presume? "'It is not sufficiently inviting.' "'I replied that I had read it. "'He waited, as if wishing me to give an opinion upon it unasked. "'Unasked, however, I was in no mood to do or say anything. "'If any concessions were to be made, if any advances were demanded, "'that was the affair of the very docile pupil of Père Silas, not mine. "'His eye settled upon me gently.' There was mildness at the moment in its blue ray. There was solicitude, a shade of pathos. There were meanings composite and contrasted, reproach melting into remorse. At the moment, probably, he would have been glad to see something emotional in me. I could not show it. In another minute, however, I should have betrayed confusion had I not bethought myself to take some quill pens from my desk and begin soberly to mend them. 
I knew that action would give a turn to his mood. He never liked to see me mend pens. My knife was always dull-edged. My hand, too, was unskillful. I hacked and chipped. On this occasion I cut my own finger, half on purpose. I wanted to restore him to his natural state, to set him at his ease, to get him to chide. Maladroite, he cried at last. She will make mincemeat of her hands. He put Sylvie down, making her lie quiet beside his bonnet grec, and depriving me of the pens and penknife, proceeded to slice, nib, and point with the accuracy and celerity of a machine. Did I like the little book? he now inquired. Suppressing a yawn, I said I hardly knew. Had it moved me? I thought it had made me a little sleepy. After a pause, Allons, donc! It was of no use taking that tone with him. Bad as I was, and he should be sorry to have to have to name all my faults at a breath, God and nature had given me trop de sensibilité et de sympathie, not to be profoundly affected by an appeal so touching. Indeed, I responded, rousing myself quickly. I was not affected at all, not a whit. And in proof, I drew from my pocket a perfectly dry handkerchief, still clean and in its folds. Hereupon, I was made the object of a string of strictures rather piquant than polite. I listened with zest. After those two days of unnatural silence, it was better than music to hear Monsieur Paul haranguing again in just his old fashion. I listened and meantime solaced myself and Sylvie with the contents of a bonbonniere, which Monsieur Emmanuel's gifts kept well supplied with chocolate comfits. It pleased him to see even a small matter from his hand duly appreciated. He looked at me and the spaniel while we shared the spoil. He put up his penknife. Touching my hand with the bundle of new-cut quills, he said, Dis donc, petite sœur, speak frankly. What have you thought of me during the last two days? but of this question I would take no manner of notice. Its purport made my eyes fill. I caressed Sylvie assiduously. Monsieur Paul, leaning over the desk, bent towards us. I call myself your brother, he said. I hardly know what I am. Brother, friend, I cannot tell. I know I think of you. I feel I wish you well. But I must check myself. You are to be feared. My best friends point out danger and whisper caution. You do right to listen to your friends. By all means, be cautious. It is your religion, your strange, self-reliant, invulnerable creed, whose influence seems to clothe you in, I know not what, unblessed panoply. You are good. Père Silas calls you good and loves you. But your terrible, proud, earnest Protestantism, there is the danger. It expresses itself by your eye at times, and again it gives you certain tones and certain gestures that make my flesh creep. You are not demonstrative, and yet, just now, when you handled that tract, my God, I thought Lucifer smiled. Certainly I don't respect that tract. What then? Not respect that tract? But it is the pure essence of faith, love, charity. I thought it would touch you. In its gentleness, I, I trusted that it could not fail. I laid it in your desk with a prayer. I must indeed be a sinner. Heaven will not hear the petitions that come warmest from my heart. You scorn my little offering. Oh, cela me fait mal. Monsieur, I don't scorn it. At least not as your gift. Monsieur, sit down. Listen to me. I am not a heathen. I am not hard-hearted. I am not unchristian. I am not dangerous, as they tell you. I would not trouble your faith. You believe in God and Christ and the Bible, and so do I. But do you believe in the Bible? Do you receive revelation? What limits are there to the wild, careless daring of your country and sect? Père Silas dropped dark hints. By dint of persuasion, I made him have to find these hints. They amounted to crafty Jesuit slanders. That night, Monsieur Paul and I talked seriously and closely. He pleaded, he argued. I could not argue, a fortunate incapacity. It needed but triumphant logical opposition to effect all the director wished to be effected. But I could talk in my own way, the way Monsieur Paul was used to, and of which he could follow the meanderings and fill the hiatus, and pardon the strange stammerings strange to him no longer. At ease with him I could defend my creed and faith in my own fashion. In some degree I could lull his prejudices. 
He was not satisfied when he went away, hardly was he appeased, but he was made thoroughly to feel that Protestants were not necessarily the irreverent pagans his director had insinuated. He was made to comprehend something of their mode of honouring the light, the life, the word. He was enabled partly to perceive that, while their veneration for things venerable was not quite like that cultivated in his church, it had its own, perhaps, deeper power, its own more solemn awe. I found that Père Silas, himself, I must repeat, not a bad man, though the advocate of a bad cause, had darkly stigmatized Protestants in general, and myself, by inference, with strange names, had ascribed to us strange isms. Monsieur Emmanuel revealed all this in frank fashion, which knew not secretiveness, looking at me as he spoke with a kind, earnest fear, almost trembling lest there should be truth in the charges. Père Silas, it seems, had closely watched me, had ascertained that I went by turns and indiscriminately to the three Protestant chapels of Villette, the French, German, and English, id est the Presbyterian, Lutheran, Episcopalian. Such liberality argued in the father's eyes profound indifference. Who tolerates all, he reasoned, can be attached to none. Now, it happened that I had often secretly wondered at the minute and unimportant character of the differences between these three sects. At the unity and identity of their vital doctrines, I saw nothing to hinder them from being one day fused into one grand holy alliance, and I respected them all, though I thought that in each there were faults of form encumbrances and trivialities. Just what I thought, that I did tell Monsieur Emmanuel, and explained to him that my own last appeal, the guide to which I looked, and the teacher which I owned, must always be the Bible itself, rather than any sect of whatever name or nation. He left me soothed, yet full of solicitude, breathing a wish as strong as a prayer that if I were wrong, heaven would lead me right. I heard, poured forth on the threshold, some fervid murmurings to Marie Reine du Ciel, some deep aspiration that his hope might yet be mine. Strange! I had no such feverish wish to turn him from the faith of his fathers. I thought Romanism wrong, a great mixed image of gold and clay, but it seemed to me that this Romanist held the pure elements of his creed with an innocency of heart which God must love. The preceding conversation passed between eight and nine o'clock of the evening in a schoolroom of the quiet Rue Fossette, opening on a sequestered garden. Probably about the same, or a somewhat later hour of the succeeding evening, its echoes, collected by holy obedience, were breathed verbatim in an attentant ear at the panel of a confessional in the hoary church of the Magi. It ensued that Père Silas paid a visit to Madame Beck, and stirred by I know not what mixture of motives, persuaded her to let him undertake for a time the heretic Englishwoman's spiritual direction. Hereupon I was put through a course of reading. That is, I just glanced at the books lent me. They were too little in my way to be thoroughly read, marked, learned, or inwardly digested. And besides, I had a book upstairs, under my pillow, whereof certain chapters satisfied my needs in the article of spiritual lore, furnishing such precept and example as, to my heart's core, I was convinced could not be improved on. Then Père Silas showed me the fair side of Rome, her good works, and bade me judge the tree by its fruits. In answer, I felt and I avowed that these works were not the fruits of Rome. They were but her abundant blossoming, but the fair promise she showed the world. That bloom, when set, savoured not of charity— the apple full-formed was ignorance, abasement, and bigotry. Out of men's afflictions and affections were forged the rivets of their servitude. Poverty was fed and clothed and sheltered, to bind it by obligation to the church. Orphanage was reared and educated that it might grow up in the fold of the church. Sickness was tended that it might die after the formula and in the ordinance of the church. And men were overwrought and women most murderously sacrificed, and all laid down a world... God made pleasant for his creatures good, and took up a cross monstrous in its galling weight, that they might serve Rome, prove her sanctity, confirm her power, and spread the reign of her tyrant church. For a man's good was little done, for God's glory less. A thousand ways were opened with pain, with blood sweats, with lavishing of life. Mountains were cloven through their breasts, and rocks were split to their base— and all for what? 
that a priesthood might march straight on and straight upward to an all-dominating eminence, whence they might at last stretch the sceptre of their Moloch church? It will not be. God is not with Rome, and, were human sorrows still for the Son of God, would he not mourn over her cruelties and ambitions, as once he mourned over the crimes and woes of doomed Jerusalem? O oh, lovers of power! O oh, mitred aspirants for this world's kingdoms! An hour will come, even to you, when it will be well for your hearts, pausing faint at each broken beat, that there is a mercy beyond human compassions, a love stronger than this strong death which even you must face, and before it fall, a charity more potent than any sin, even yours, a pity which redeems worlds, nay, absolves priests. My third temptation was held out in the pomp of Rome, the glory of her kingdom. I was taken to the churches on solemn occasions, days of fete and state. I was shown the papal ritual and ceremonial. I looked at it. Many people, men and women, no doubt far my superiors in a thousand ways, have felt this display impressive, have declared that though their reason protested, their imagination was subjugated. I cannot say the same. Neither full procession, nor high mass, nor swarming tapers, nor swinging censers, nor ecclesiastical millinery, nor celestial jewellery, touched my imagination a whit. What I saw struck me as tawdry, not grand, as grossly material, not poetically spiritual. This I did not tell Père Silas. He was old, he looked vulnerable. Through every abortive experiment, under every repeated disappointment, he remained personally kind to me, and I felt tender of hurting his feelings. But on the evening of a certain day, when, from the balcony of a great house, I had been made to witness a huge mingled procession of the church and the army, priests with relics and soldiers with weapons, an obese and aged archbishop, habited in cambric and lace, looking strangely like a grey daw in bird-of-paradise plumage, and a band of young girls fantastically robed and garlanded, then— I spoke my mind to Monsieur Paul. "'I did not like it,' I told him. "'I did not respect such ceremonies. I wished to see no more.' And having relieved my conscience by this declaration, I was able to go on, and, speaking more currently than my wont, to show him that I had a mind to keep to my reformed creed, that the more I saw of popery, the closer I clung to Protestantism. Doubtless there were errors in every church— but I now perceive by contrast how severely pure was my own compared with her whose painted and meretricious face had been unveiled for my admiration. I told him how we kept fewer forms between us and God, retaining indeed no more than perhaps the nature of mankind in the mass rendered necessary for due observance. I told him I could not look on flowers and tinsel, on wax lights and embroidery, at such times and under such circumstances as should be devoted to lifting the secret vision to him whose home is infinity, and his being eternity. That when I thought of sin and sorrow, of earthly corruption, mortal depravity, weighty temporal woe, I could not care for chanting priests or murmuring officials. That when the pains of existence and the terrors of dissolution pressed before me, when the mighty hope and measureless doubt of the future arose in view, then— even the scientific strain, or the prayer in a language learned and dead, harassed with hindrance a heart which only longed to cry, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. When I had so spoken, so declared my faith, and so widely severed myself from him, I addressed, then, at last, came a tone accordant, an echo responsive, one sweet chord of harmony in two conflicting spirits. "'Whatever say priests or controversialists,' murmured Monsieur Manuel, "'God is good and loves all the sincere. "'Believe them what you can, and believe it as you can. "'One prayer at least we have in common. "'I also cry, "'O oh Dieu, sois apaisé envers moi qui serpécheur. "'He leaned on the back of my chair. "'After some thought he again spoke. "'How seem in the eyes of that God who made all firmaments, from whose nostrils issued whatever of life is here, or in the stars shining yonder, how seem the differences of man? But as time is not for God, nor space, so neither is measure nor comparison. We abase ourselves in our littleness, and we do right, yet it may be that the constancy of one heart, 
the truth and faith of one mind according to the light he has appointed, import as much to him as the just motion of satellites about their planets, of planets about their suns, of suns around that mighty unseen centre incomprehensible, irrealizable, with strange mental effort only divined. God guide us all. God bless you, Lucy. End of chapter 36 Recorded by Moira Fogarty